we have reached the point in the NFL where you can't even take a breath without hearing about analytics. It's actually gotten so out of control to the point I think it annoys even thoughtful football fans. However, we're here to solve all that hate against analytics. To do it, we're going to get into the actual work that's being done by people actually doing it, how it helps, what NFL teams are doing, what we think the NFL is missing, where the NFL goes from here, and what we can do to forecast better. A uh, peek behind the curtain of football analytics, if you will. For this, I'm joined by an illustrious panel. You all know and love our own Michael Leone. He's running our data side team. Also here is Matt Mano of Sports Info Solutions, aka SIS. Doing some really useful stuff in terms of data collection and tons more. And last but not least, Seth Walder of ESPN. Let's start here. And I'll start with you, Matt. I think you guys have direct relationships with NFL teams. What do you think the main ways NFL teams are using analytics? Or when they come to you guys, what do they say they want work on, they want help with? How is the NFL using analytics right now? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are a few sort of ways I think you could answer that question. The first way is sort of like you can use it for game planning, you know, your weekly strategy. You can use it for roster construction. So certainly the front office has uses, the coaches have uses, and a lot of teams will split up their analysts that way to be more front office focused versus that. Um, a big one that you probably don't think as much about is like the performance side of things. So where it interacts with the strength coaches and all that kind of stuff, that that's kind of uh, another one of the big pillars there. Um, and then uh, really, I think to the degree that it permeates the actual decision-making, that that's where it really, I think, goes from something that that you're doing to something that that you're using and that's really going to be very team dependent there are some teams that are fully in all across the board and there are certain departments and coaches here and there that find different use cases so it's it's a little bit all over the place yeah i mean i know seth i think when you're in the like public sphere doing this stuff people think the like the majority of people when they think of football analytics they think of two things fourth downs should i go or should i kick and two points, should I go for it or should I kick an extra point? And it feels like it's been boiled down to just that when people don't realize, I mean, you can use analytics for roster uh, management cap stuff, you know, draft evaluations, like Matt talked about game plan strategy, game day decisions. What do you think about how NFL teams are using analytics, Seth, and how frustrated are you that people just beak at you about two point and fourth down all the time? Well, it's funny because like there is this, this tension where you like people think it's just fourth down. All you do is talk about fourth down, but, and yet like, despite all that conversation, uh, teams are still pretty far from optimal on fourth down and two points. So it's like got no choice, but to just keep, keep hitting it because if teams are sacrificing their own chances to win the game, like that's pretty notable. But like, to your point, the thing that always surprises me when I'm talking to folks around the league or not surprised me, but I just find it interesting. is just like the breadth of what they're doing. So it, it really is like, like Matt talked about, you're talking about things that are literally in the game, you know, ranging from being on the headset and advising the coach to go for it on fourth down to game plan, planning in season to preparing for free agency, player pro player evaluation, college player evaluation, like, draft forecasting, you have all of these elements that do make it sort of a year round role, despite the fact that it's like, we in, in other parts of football, we often have this sort of like specialty, right? Like you have coaches help on help with, in the off season with front office stuff, but like they're primarily coaches and vice versa. And you tend to have an analytics team, at least a team that's spanning work over, over the course of the 12 months of the year. Yeah. I there's a lot of work to be done, right? We covered a bunch of different topics that you can use analytics to help with an NFL team. I, do you have any idea, Seth, how many people are on these analytics teams? I know it varies team by team, but I mean, I would shudder to think that at ETR, we have four full-time guys working on this. I would hope that every NFL team worth billions of dollars has more than four. But yeah, do you have any idea how big these, these kind of teams are and what teams are spending? on analytics these days. Yeah, so this is something I track and staffing has grown immensely over, I think I started tracking this in 2020 and since then team staffing has grown immensely. It's funny you, you mentioned that because I was just, this morning I reported that the Titans have hired two two new analysts and that brings them to four. So they've, they've matched ETR now, but like 
seriously, it was not that long ago that the Titans were the last team that didn't have any analytics staffers, right? And so, like, to go from zero to four in two-ish years or so is is pretty remarkable. I would say that three or four is kind of standard. It depends on how you're you're counting. Uh, so I'll, I'm counting like analysts or analytics management, someone that, uh, you know, like a director or something like that. And then you, you tend to have developers or software engineers that are in a bit of a gray area and I don't have a perfect mechanism to like delineate uh, and, and it's different team to team. Those people like on our team play a critical role in the work that we do. And sometimes in football teams, they are like fully embedded in analytics. And sometimes it's sort of like, that is one piece of the work that they're doing. So yeah, I would say I three or four maxing it. Like, I mean, the Browns have a have a ton of folks. Can can I ask right. when are we going to get the the famous update that comes annually? I think around this time of year. Oh yeah, it's it's no joke. It's on my to do list for like tomorrow and tomorrow and Monday. I gotta. I, it's like way overdue. I gotta. Yeah. I gotta update update the the list. We'll all be watching your Twitter account. <laughs> Adam, I think mostly Seth is saying that we're equipped to run an NFL team now. That's what, so, that's what Seth is saying, but, exactly. But I do have you know a friend that works in the analytics department for a team that I thought was like pretty pro analytics heavy, and it's like they've got three guys. And I know Matt said like in some departments they're splitting up like who's doing front office, who's doing game day. But it sounds like they're they, these three guys are doing everything, and like you know, they don't necessarily even have like databases, like they're saving stuff on CSV. So it sounds more like grassrootsy than I would have like an anticipated. So um, again, this is just one example, but it does seem like there's still a ways to go for, you know, a lot of these teams out there. So I think it speaks to the adoption cycle. So SIS used to be baseball info solutions. So we've been doing baseball teams for 22 years, something like that. And we've kind of been able to see like what the future looks like in a way as uh, the adopt as it's sort of matured there um, obviously football and baseball are different nobody i don't want to get into that one of those debates but like um, when it comes to football you've sort of seen the people that were stuck in the mud about it and other people that really dug into it and i think we're at one of these inflection points where the one right now i think is if you were doing nothing or thinking you could get by with one or two people now the the market has clearly revealed that you are behind the eight ball and that you need to build your own internal systems uh, in, a, in a more robust way and you need to really embrace this stuff. And so there's sort of a catch up hiring that goes on right now, but it, it comes in these funny little waves of people get ahead, people feel that they're behind and both of those motivations actually lead towards the cycle of, of more and more adoption. I'm curious where you guys think analytics can have its biggest impact in the NFL. You know. I I don't think you need to be some math genius to manage the cap in the NFL. You know, I consider Harry Roseman the best manager of the cap in the NFL. I know they have a robust analytics team, but I feel like that's more business, common sense, you know, not do what the Cowboys do. Don't, you don't let CeeDee Lamb, Micah Parsons, Dak Prescott all get to their final year of their contract without extending any of them, right? That's not math. That's like common sense. Um, I My gut is that analytics are best used for player evaluation at a better level than man this guy looks really fast on tape or man look at that guy's hip swivel to me data on player evaluation is where it can have the biggest impact but i'll start with you seth where do you think analytics can slash should have the biggest impact in the nfl so i think your answer is like what should be right but to me the most obvious and largest remaining edge is draft day trades so this is like something that came into the public eye, like at the same time, actually before fourth downs. And when we think about like the shift that we've had on fourth downs over the last 10 years, that really hasn't happened, not even close to the same degree in, in draft day trades. And I think that we're going to look back 10 years from now and like think about how preposterous teams, preposterously teams were behaving in the draft like today. And I, I think about like, watching some of these videos that teams put out have been re are really illuminating you watched like the rams video where they are desk calling teams begging to get robbed blind and uh and teams saying actually no thanks and so like this is like it's like i, I don't want to say it's settled science because it's not and there's lots of different 
ways you could evaluate things on on the margins, but every single like quantitative analysis on the draft has all come that it back with the same conclusion that teams trading down end up getting so much more value. And like of sure. course there are exceptions all over the place, but teams are passing this up. So go ahead. Yeah. The- I think part of that is overconfidence in player valuation. And we deal with this in in fantasy also. People say, I want my guy. I know this guy is going to go off this year. I know you guys are all idiots. It's a sure. People don't realize that the player valuation side of it is is much harder. And that's tough for me to say personally because I am, I I love my player takes. You know what I mean? So I get what teams uh, are doing. Matt, any thoughts on that question? Where is the biggest impact? analytics can slash should have in the NFL. Yeah, I, yeah, I have so many different thoughts on that. And just going back to, to kind of build on Seth's point, I think when you look at like fourth downs, for example, I'm very open to the perspective that you are taking on more risk by going for it on fourth down and that strategically it may not be in your best interest to always maximize win probability in every fourth down decision. And I, I'm very amenable to that thought and that, you know, in the financial markets, the more risk you take on, the more rewards you get. Um, So maybe there is some thought about how to modulate the fourth down models there like that. In the case of the draft stuff that Seth's talking about, this should be settled. It's, it seems like it's been obvious for a long time that this is the way it is. I remember I was in uh, New Orleans when we drafted Mark Ingram. Uh, We had just got Cam Jordan. We made a perfectly good first round pick. And then we traded uh, our second round pick and a future first round pick to move back into the first round and draft a running back. Um, no matter how you feel about running backs, Mark Ingram, good player. Not, not even like complaining that much about that side of it. But just wait a minute. We could just pick somebody in 10 picks and then pick somebody next year in the first round, or we can have this one guy now. Um, to me, that that was wrong in the way that you were talking about, Adam, and how it's just obvious business. But it's also, I think... Um, like the 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 amount of uh, of research that's gone into this that's been publicly available, it's it's pretty remarkable that how stuck in the mud people have been. Yeah, it was my fault. I should have let people know that you actually were in the NFL. I know you worked with the Saints and I believe the Browns also. Do you want to tell the people what you did for those teams? Well, I was a scout. I was fully on the scouting side. So I'm like the captain of. I don't even like to use the word analytics with people if it makes them uncomfortable. Uh, to me, where, you, where can analytics make the most impact? Where can using information to help make better decisions make an impact? The answer is everywhere. And where the most is going to be, it's, it's really hard to say. But, um, but right now, it's like low-hanging fruit is enough to give you an advantage over what the other teams are doing. Yeah, Leone, I mean, on our side, we're trying to use analytics and data to better project player performance, particularly, I think, at the college level. A lot of people in our space are doing that in terms of college data. Any thoughts on using analytics for player performance or anything like that? Yeah, I think we see it most heavily, like you said, in terms of like prospect modeling. I think that's where the fantasy industry gets most nerdy and most into analytics. I know um, Anthony Amico, who we have, who does our dynasty rankings, does a great job. JJ Zachariason of LateRound.com, like I'm always looking at his prospect models. And it's really intriguing to me on that standpoint And even think of like the book Astro Ball, like reading through that, how they were able to kind of like combine the quantitative info and the qualitative info. So like taking scouting reports, but like actually using that in a model as opposed to just saying like, oh, this this guy's got such a motor on him. Like we if we save enough data and that includes like qualitative scouting reports, like we can start improving, you know, our actual models incorporating that. So I think that's really interesting what people are doing in prospect models to kind of proxy that is mostly just using draft capital as like a really key input. And again, that's for fantasy performance though, not for real life performance. Yeah, I'm curious, Matt, because I feel like this is the uh, problem or this is the where the heads butt. You're on the road, you're away from your wife and your kids, you're watching these players for six months and then some nerd in the front office who has never seen them play at all ran some model and said, no, you're wrong. Uh, your eyes deceived you. This guy actually sucks, right? Uh, do you think that's going on? Is that an issue? I And, you know, they made that kind of famously in the Moneyball movie where, you know, Brad Pitt gets into the argument with the old guys where he says, oh, he's got a great jawbone. He throws hard, whatever. 
Um, do you think that's an issue remains an issue? And how does that work in actual NFL teams? Yeah, uh, in plays where it's in places where it's dysfunctional, it's certainly still like that in a lot of ways. It's siloed. It's I do my scouting, you do your analytics. And if they disagree, it's a war, uh, in, in, you know, to the death. Um, I think that in in the best scenarios, what actually happens is it's not this dichotomy of this is scouting and this is analytics. It's blended together. So you're using your analysts to make scouts that are more informed, that can understand the information that you found that's important, that they buy into, that they can use to organize their cut ups. Right. A big part of this, we can help you organize the information that's going to let you do your job better um, in, in more insightful ways. Right. If you're trying to figure out um how a quarterback performs in a situation a particular situation or i need to see a cut up of every time this player has been injured so that my trainers can get through their reports more quickly what there are all kinds of different things so i'm always the teams that are pushing it together that are understanding hey what are you doing as a coaching staff right now okay we have these ideas to do that better which of these from this menu are you interested in all right we're going to execute on that we're going to build credibility and, and then you get into the cycle of it being embedded and it being something that, that can really make a difference. Yeah. Um, it's very difficult. People get afraid of it. People think scouts are going to be replaced by analytics. To what you just said, the best information that teams have is the scouting information. It's the information collected by their experts that they've hired to collect the information in their specific way that their organization uh, does things. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I'm... It runs the gamut, though, the way different teams use it. So to Matt's point, too, like that information is so critical and key where I think analytics helps a lot, not only in terms of Matt saying, like informing scouts, like what to look for, but then also in terms of how to weight that information to make the best decisions like that can be really difficult. We have a hard time with this in fantasy, like, you know, we're double counting all the time Adam. we talk about like the weather on a given week. Well, I don't know if we want to get Adam started on a weather ramp, but yes. um, for, for DFS, you know, people like they double count, they triple count, like this guy's on a hot streak. It's like, well, that's like kind of baked into like our updated like volume and efficiency baselines for that player. Like we can't like double count on top of that. So just weighting the information properly. And that's a huge thing with prospect modeling too. Like for a while, you know, the big thing was early declare wide receivers versus not early declare wide receivers. And it was like viewed really binary. And then someone like Chris Alave comes out and a lot of people were like anti Alave solely because he was a non early declare wide receiver. And then there were others that I think were a little bit more open minded about it, you know, just weighting that as like one piece of information. Yeah. You know, the self scouting part of it, I think, Seth, is important. You know, the Titans, you just mentioned they had no analytics department, they let AJ Brown walk as a young wide receiver, they've since realized their mistake, right? They just spent a ton on Calvin Ridley, but man, if you can self scout and the scouts should have seen that AJ Brown is an absolute monster. The data was obvious that AJ Brown was an absolute monster and they still let him walk. I feel like if they had an analytics department, maybe they wouldn't have, which brings me to me Baron's question here. Me Baron said, what are some examples of the types of analysis that are now considered table stakes among NFL analytics departments. So what is the bare minimum? What are table stakes to have in the NFL these days, do you think, Seth? I, I thought this was a really interesting question. So I, I texted a few people last night, you know, like staffers in the league, to get their thoughts. And like what I got back was fourth down and two, a lot of stuff we talked about, fourth down and two point reports, um, like tracking workload, player workload, performance stuff Matt mentioned. Some type, uh, folks felt like, Every team at this point has some type of player draft projection, even if it's a simple, basic, simple PFF and measurables kind of basic model. And then also probably at this point, maybe a like a draft forecasting model. So I think we've heard like a lot in very recent years where a team starts to say like, you know, we had this person at a 60% chance to reach us at this, at this pick, right? Sort of the, we, we have our draft day predictor and teams are, are doing that kind of work internally matters a lot for trades, right? Like what's the probability this guy makes it to us. If we trade back, what's the probability that this player makes it to us. Um, and then just like really basic team tendency uh, play calling report for coaching staff. So like all of those things would be, I think, 
bare minimum table stakes, things that you would expect from 32 teams. That leaves like a lot that is above that line. Like I didn't say a draft pick trade valuation chart. We didn't talk about like, I think, I think someone said like, you know, speeds okay from NGS, but like we didn't say anything about like player tracking, player evaluation or, um, you know, other sort of like more advanced game planning, something like that. I mean, but I think that, to, to, to say that that's probably what we're getting from 32 teams is a is probably yeah that's what I would call the table stakes everybody is get everybody is doing that right um yes we could do that if NFL teams need uh ETR's analytics department Leone is uh Leone you can find some time in the evenings to help a team go from total donkeys to table stakes at least I think but, see that's or, or we could improve our best ball mania expected value by one dollar and 32 cents <laughs> so I think there's a trick with that, though, which is that Leone could totally do it. The problem is, in my opinion, the real table stakes are organizational buy-in, leadership having any buy-in and caring about yeah. what you're doing. There are lots of people that can do all that stuff that Seth just mentioned, but there's not 100% of teams that actually are going to pay attention to it, value it. That's the real, I think, inflection point okay. when people are really doing stuff. And the reason that I think that's the case is because – the football guys, the old school football guys are, are going to say, and they're not idiots. These are smart guys. They're going to say, you're missing the human element. You're missing things that analytics does not have the human element, things that, you know, data uh, is not capturing on the surface, such as Dan Campbell in that Cowboys game. You know, he's all about the emotions. He's all about, hey, I'm going to lead this team. We're going to play tough. He told his team, we're going to go for two to win the game. And even though it was so clearly the wrong thing to do, in that Cowboys game, whatever week that was, week 17 or whatever. He promised his team to go for it. His team wants him to go for it. His team loves playing for him and he does it. You're missing the human element. Now that's an extreme example. Obviously Dan Campbell shouldn't have done that. But what well, the I NFL- Well, one of the best fourth down coaches in the right. league. Like, like- D Dan Campbell's the bridge between <laughs> right. the old school and the analytics. He's, he's our savior. He's our hero. Right, exactly. So so I guess my, my point is that the pushback is always going to be we're missing something. And I'm actually sympathetic to that. Like, I do think that you can miss something in data from being around these football guys, Matt, do you get the sense that they think analytics is missing something? And do you put any stock in that human element stuff? If, if analytics people are so, uh, I don't want to say any mean words. If these people actually believe that there are things that they, that they capture everything, and that there's no use for coaches or anything that's going on. Like the, the hubris involved in that is just crazy to me. I'm I'm fully team old school football guy if those are the choices. But I firmly believe those are not the choices. Yeah, those are not. I've never yeah. heard a single person like who operates that way. And that's why I think it's like a, you have to get this sort of straw man oh, argument. You haven't been on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> but it does work both ways where like – Again, that's where like the organizational buy is going to be on both sides. And like, there's got to be some sort of, you know, aligned. I mean, the, the incentives obviously should be aligned, but some sort of like goal where like each side understands where they're coming from, like what they're working toward. If you just tell, you know, the clients to come up with a fourth down model and the coach doesn't care, like, what's the point? Like, you, you know, it's got to be some sort of collaboration where you'd, you'd hope that you know, before that model even gets built, that there's some interaction between the two sides so that they're working like towards a common goal and they like kind of both understand like what, you know, what the process is. Obviously, you know, the math isn't going to be understood by everybody, but like the general overarching idea should be. Okay. Nobody can do anything in analytics without having data to work with. So I think that's where things like PFF and SIS came in to play and I'm sure there's other companies out there that NFL teams are using I guess one way to do this Matt is to do it yourself right like you're an NFL team you're worth billions of dollars get your own data you know figure out a way to get your own unique data there's nothing more valuable than data no one else has that's good it strikes me though that a lot of these teams are just farming it out hey we'll just pay SIS we'll just pay PFF and we will get the data that way so Matt how do you think data collection is going right now yeah, the NFL. I think there's sort of like a few different like uh, flavors of it. So the league is sharing, for example, the next gen data with with all the teams. So all the teams have access to that similar data. However, 
all of that is not necessarily always sort of curated for team use as, as its primary purpose. So uh, that's one thing, but um, there ends up being data needs that a bunch of teams have that it just makes more sense instead of us each collecting it ourselves. We know you're going to collect it and you're going to collect it. It's sort of you, you pull it together. And then there are the secretive projects, whether it's teams bringing things in-house, like you know the Browns famously have done that for, for years, uh, their own sort of thing that way, um, or, 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 or maybe both actually in the case of the Browns, working with the companies uh, too to either get in on those data sets or to negotiate exclusive and even secretive data sets that if you have a long track record with a company and you have a lot of trust built up, you can know that we can silo things that uh, that are only going to be seen by you that are specific for your purposes. And, um, you know, if you're not just a, a team that uh, has an operation staff that can step up and has a machine learning apparatus that that's fully built out, it can make a lot of sense to work with a company on that sort of thing. I, I think, Seth, a splash that you guys made was with the open score stuff for wide receivers. I have no idea how you guys are doing that. I don't know if you want to say how. You yeah, guys yeah. are how you guys are calculating this, but that's like to me an example of unique data that I think we can get hopefully get more of going forward. So yeah, maybe I, Open Score has gotten very popular in in the fantasy streets and stuff like that. Maybe you can tell the people about how it works. Sure. So and and I think this is probably where and Matt's kind of alluding to this, like where teams can make it make the, separate themselves from one another and and gain an advantage even if they're all working with the same data. Our receiver tracking metrics are we, we have access to next gen stats player tracking data. So, you know, there's chips in every player's shoulder pads. We get every tenth of a second their speed, location, or like direction they're facing. Um, and what we work towards, like I think the biggest thing is like initially you sort of we got that data and there's there's lots of measurements you can do. And and for receivers, people first looked at separation, right? And uh, what we've like very quickly realized was how little separation told you in and of itself. It's driven by factors like how close are you to the first down marker? Are you a slot receiver? Are you driving inside? What kind of route are you running? What kind of defense? Are they playing man? Are they playing zone? What Brian Burke, my coworker, created was these metrics designed to quantify specific skills that receivers have. And, and open score is the most important, so I'll talk about that. And the idea is to figure out how open does a player get relative to expectations set by the play? So set meaning like what route are you running? What coverage are they playing? Like where are you aligned? Or is the did the quarterback run play action? Factors like that. And we and it's not and 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 differentiating between separation and openness is key. I, I like the example I always use is this like AJ Brown fourth and four play where from two years ago where. He just runs like a little slant, but he makes this little dummy move at first and he kind of sends the defender the wrong way. And yeah, by the time the ball comes, the defender is like there. He's very close to him, but he's behind him. And Brown has all the leverage. And so he gets a super high open score for the play. And what we found is that that skill opens, your ability to generate openness is sticky from year to year. And it's the most predictive of future production. So yeah, like for fantasy, Absolutely. It's something like I consult. I certainly think about uh, like that is like that is the most consistent performance of a player. We have different styles of receivers, uh, so it won't be everyone's strength that is a good receiver. But if I'm like trying to identify a breakout, trying to determine who's like year like year one has potential to turn into something more in year two, those are those are numbers I look at. I think that is a good example of like. And this is the kind of project that we're not going to see, but player evaluation, what you're, what Adam talked about as being like key for teams, using player tracking data to identify player skills and quantify them at a level that we could never have done with box scores. Like this is like the, the frontier of, right. of analytics and where teams make a, a big difference. Yeah. This is the cutting edge stuff, Leonie. I, I will say the, la the last year in open score, ESPN's open score, number one was Keenan Allen. Number two, C.D. Lamb. I'll skip number three. Number four, Tyreek Hill. Number five, Gary Wilson. Number three was Khalif Raymond. Obviously, it was on a smaller sample, but a lot of these guys, it, it were you know, in the top ten is Brandon Ayuk, Tank Dell, A.J. Brown, DeAndre Hopkins, Garrett Wilson, Tyreek Hill, C.D. Lamb, Keenan Allen. It kind of makes some 
intuitive sense. I feel like Leone, this stuff comes out in the wash in ability to earn targets, right? And so like, obviously, you're, if you get open, you're going to get targeted from your quarterback. I feel like where we can use this more is maybe players who had poor quarterback play. You know, Cortland Sutton who scores highly Garrett Wilson. on here. Garrett Wilson, Deontay Johnson scores highly on here. So yeah, what do you think about using this stuff for fantasy? Yeah, what's difficult sometimes with this stuff for fantasy is like, let's say one guy has a really good open score, but we already know kind of like what his target share was achieving that open score, like what his efficiency metrics were. And is there a reason for those numbers to change based on the fact that this player is really good in open score, really bad in open score? Um, and that can be like more difficult than it seems. Like it's not as easy as just being like, oh, this guy's great in open score. Like let's jack him up because a lot of our baselines are already based on what he did when he achieved that open score. Uh, but it can be very useful, like small sample size stuff or like, um, especially comparing players' current open scores to their past one. Like talk Keenan Allen up there, right? Like I'm going to be curious tracking an older player's open score mm -hmm. over the course of the season. Like that would be very valuable to like see if they're starting to become like an age cliff drop off or vice versa for a breakout player. So that, that's the type of stuff we're looking into. I'm curious if you guys have any running back metrics that you particularly like. I see rush yards over expectation thrown out a lot, and I kind of have a, a take that that's not a very good metric. So I'm curious what you guys think there. It just seems to me, looking at some of the breakdowns, that like it doesn't do a good enough job separating the running back from the team setup and the offensive line. Um, I know a lot of people use this as a case against like Rashad White, like he's really bad in rush yards over expectation, but basically every single back Tampa Bay's had the last two years has been god awful in efficiency. They haven't been good backs, but they've been really, really bad. So how much is it Rashad White versus the team? So like, here's your thought on rush yards over expectation versus using maybe something that's more like broken tackles, you know, per opportunity or something like that. So I'm glad you asked about that because I was going to try to chime in with respect to uh, the last stat, but this stat's a good one too. So um, this the, the sort of stats that we find that are sticky are broken and missed tackles more so than anything. The yards after contact above expectation can be really dependent on a lot of very random things, right? If you think about it, you're taking an average that can include some outliers in there. So, it, so uh, it kind of makes sense that just how often are you creating broken and missed tackles? is is a little bit more sticky um, but what's really valuable is combining that with a model that's going to give you um the expected rush yards because a lot of times in football the part that's sticky is not the player's performance above or below an expectation it's actually what the expectation was to begin with right so take uh, we have a stat that we call pressures above expectation and it's basically meant to look at how often you're creating pressures as a, as a pass rusher more or less than we would expect. And what's great about that is it allows us to compare a three technique to a zero technique to somebody that plays all along the line to somebody that's constantly facing third down and, and long versus somebody who's in a defense that never pl that plays in a third down, all this other kind of stuff. So the context is the part that's really predictive in most of these things. That's usually the part, the expected performance that we find that's stickier. And it's actually the individual player's performance that tends to be more volatile above or below it. So I like flipping this whole thing on, my, on its head if I'm thinking about fantasy. And what I'm thinking about is where can I predict the expected performance really well? Where's a situation where uh, it's it's been the same offensive line for the last three years and we know exactly what the expected yards before contact is? Now we're talking about something that's really sticky year over year if you're not having a lot of personnel shuffling and injuries. And then we can figure out, okay, pair that with a running back who's getting more broken and missed tackles than expected. And now we're giving ourselves the best chance to succeed, in my opinion. So it's kind of about deconstructing where the predictiveness really is. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Larry, have you have you like looked at it or are you or are you just like or are you anecdotally feeling like uh, rush yards over expectation isn't stable? Because the only reason I ask is I have not, but I think Mike Lopez, the NFL's director, um, had looked into this and kind of looked at players switching teams and found stability from year to year on that as long as he was – I think he was capping long runs maybe at, at 20 yards over expectation because it's kind of like 
you know, certain point has nothing to do with it. No, that. I was I was firing from the hip. I was anecdotally lo- looking at that. Um, I don't think it's really, like, I can think of other that, examples of like, you know, know for a long time, like, the running backs were always doing well, but then actually, I don't think Jerome Ford did last year. So, yeah, um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's definitely, I find it to be useful, just maybe over respected as like this, this is like the running back metric. Like, like we figured it out, right. you know, and I, it's more like a piece. Yeah. By the way, Anyone has access to that. Uh, you can just go to Next Gen Stats or yeah. whatever, and anyone has access to that data. Same with ESPN's Open Score. Uh, all that stuff is publicly available. I wanted to get into uh, the player tracking data because I talked about getting data collection. I feel like this is, like Seth said, you know, the cutting edge, the the next wave. I feel like we're just at the beginning. Seth, do you have any ideas what more we can do with this player tracking data? And maybe we can use it to figure out like what's coming next in the NFL. I and mean, the NFL has changed so much about how teams are defending. And, you know, I feel like more teams now are daring teams to run the football. They're playing more cover too. And I feel like some of that at least is from analytics. What do you think is the next frontier? Where else can we use the player tracking data? And where does the NFL go from here? Well, the true cutting edge right now, I think is, is doing this, but for college. So college player tracking data came after NFL tracking data. And so now teams are real, are incorporating the same kind of player evaluation models that they might run on pro personnel on college personnel and that can that can make a big difference as well but i agree with you that i still feel like generally we are still pretty tip of the iceberg i mean we have like i don't i'm not trying to like tout our own stuff but you know we have like we've created our our win our like our pass block and pass rush win rates and same for the run game and and we've got these receiver open scores you know these receiver tracking metrics but like i mean if you just look at every year, the NFL runs this big data bowl where they it's a big, it's a big hackathon. They release a sort of subset of tracking data and they let people go wild on it for some sort of like uh, a prompt. And every year out of there, people come up with some like pretty incredible metrics. Um, and I think it just shows like how how many how many more certainly like there's more like positions to tackle, more skills to identify. But I also think to me like identifying. The two like next like the biggest things that we don't do would be like a lot of like scheme quantifying scheme mm-hmm. is something that's just so critical and we're really lacking. And then like I mean the ultimate sort of holy grail is like decision making, right? The, is the quarterback at every at any given moment is he throwing to this player? Is he scrambling? Is he throwing to that player? And, and that, that's true for for everyone, right? Not just quarterback, but linebackers and safeties and all of that. So like yeah, I think there's a I think that there is a long way to go. We have access to all of this information, but it is highly complex. Like there is a reason it's it's taken time to get to where we are and we'll, you know, things will progress, but there's a ways to go. I mean, when you were in the league, Matt, I feel like it was not as, I mean, I know it was not as pass heavy as it is now. And at least part of that is due to people understanding more about the data. I mean, there's been huge systemic changes in the way NFL games are game plan for, and called do you think that will continue do you have any ideas about where the nfl could be going next in terms of using data to change strategies yeah i think you're spot on that there'll be a lot more to come and there'll be there'll be ebbs and flows to it as well um like we saw sort of the the too high revolution and then we saw some teams sort of getting exposed in the run game a little bit zagging the other way uh we saw a lot of teams go lean into zone run games and here come the Detroit Lions basically blowing up everything you know about power and duo and and running it in every every different direction. So um, I think there'll be there'll be ebbs and flows as far as that goes. The history of football is a league where over time defense catches up to offense and then the league changes the rules to favor offense. So that's what I continue to expect to happen over time. And yeah, like there might be like baseball, there were shifts. Now there are no shifts again. There's pitch clocks. Uh, in basketball, three is 50% more than two. Absolutely changed the way that that the game is played. There's more of that to come for sure. I could imagine a scenario in the future where you're playing with multiple quarterbacks on the field. The, the game could become much more positionless. Um, I think sports, as they get more and more influenced by analytics, they tend to value uh, spacing and, and positionlessness. Versatility is another word for that, I guess. More and more and more. So... I, I think that, yeah, t- 
tip of the iceberg is to say the least. We're just sort of starting to scratch the surface. Uh, two things I do want to circle back on, though. Another one, injury risk, injury management, a big part on the performance side. This is a sport about staying healthy. Look at who's playing in the playoffs every year. Staying healthy is a big, big part of the race. If you can find in incremental advantages there, I think that's huge. And if you're drafting a season-long fantasy team, or if you're taking win total over-unders, and you have an understanding of injury risk better than when I was with the Saints, he's been injured before, he's likely to get injured again. He's never been injured. He's not likely to get injured. Actually putting a percentage on it is really, really valuable. So that's one. And then the other thing, almost everything we've discussed is descriptive or predictive analytics, where baseball is now is prescriptive analytics. It's actually using the tracking data to help in player development, to help develop the schemes, to help execute them better. So I think a lot of that stuff, it's, it's uh, one of the uh, Astros books was brought up before, but the other one I think is uh, the MVP machine. And that's a lot about actually applying this knowledge to, to make the player better and not just pick the player that you think is going to perform the best. Okay. Go ahead. Well, uh, one thing I want to talk about with the player tracking data and like that conversation, we're starting to get some really cool data from SIS to investigate and like improve our models and our forecasting. But like for someone who, out there who's listening, who's a fantasy player that maybe doesn't have access to this data or a ton of time, like, you know, we spent multiple years just using simple data really, really well and like making sure we weren't, you know, doing actively harmful things and like accounting for biases in the data and just putting that together really well. So I think a lot of this stuff's really important, but like based on what you're trying to do and accomplish, sometimes like starting with the, the simpler data and just attacking that super well is uh, important. For sure. That's a good transition to a question we got a bunch, which is, I like sports. I like math. Uh, how can I break in to this? Uh, you know, or I, I want to work part time on this or whatever. Maybe Leone, you should talk about what we look for when we hire people for the analytics team. And then I'm also curious what, what Matt and Seth think about helping the people out there who want to get into this stuff. Yeah. Um, uh well, when we did put up a job posting for our analytics department, we basically just put out like a few questions that we were interested in figuring out how to solve things and, and just saw what people could put together. So like, we're always more interested in like what you can actually do and like show us something unique and using these skills. than we are like what your actual technical background is, but that said, uh, as a smaller company, and it sounds like some of these analytics departments are like smaller than you might think, like being a jack of all trades helps a little bit, you know? Um, for us, like playing the games matters a lot. And not all of our analytics team played the games we're talking about, like DFS, sports betting and whatnot, but a good chunk of them do. So they like have that like understanding of like, I guess, concept of skin in the game. And like, it's just a little bit different than if you're like purely outside. So that's helpful. And then also, yeah, like if you can do a little bit of everything, like if you can you know, code in different languages or just like think through things real thoroughly um, and just help out a lot of areas. That's, you know, something that's really important to us. I yeah. do think that like, you know, when we're hiring or when teams are hiring, I mean, I, I do think the technical skills are, are pretty crucial, but like they are achievable. And so even if you are someone that doesn't code, I mean, like I would just start with Ben Baldwin's Beginner's Guide to NFL Fast R, NFL F-A-S-T-R. Like that is a great place to learn R and like start with football data. And like one of the beauties I think of uh, of R, which is the only programming language I know, so I can't speak to anything else, but like is like you don't need to know very much before you can do something. And so like before you know it, you're going to you're going to like start making charts and then you can learn about you know statistical modeling. And, and it's like I, I promise it is achievable and um especially now like like not to like evangelize this but like man chat gpt is a huge game changer for this like i have been able to take on coding projects over the last year that like i really would have been just way too time intensive if i if i didn't have that it's going to be wrong like all the time and you're gonna have to figure out like why it's wrong but it's going to get you started in so many ways um so like learning like different modeling techniques or and, and learning the code, I like, I, it really is, is doable. And you really like, you really can do that. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm glad Seth said like two of those things, like the chat GPT stuff, like we're looking for people that can ask the right questions, right? Like, especially more than ever, like if you can think critically, ask the right questions and like have some like creativity and intelligence in the problem solving, like you, you can get help in terms of like actually achieving that. So I think that's really important. And then also um, on the coding stuff, you know, I would say like I, I'm self-taught, it's yeah. not as big of an obstacle as you probably think it is. Seth mentioned R. I do Python, but I code a lot in what's called a Jupyter Notebook, which is similar to like R, where you, you can just run lines of code at a time and like see what you're doing and the output. So it's like way more manageable than, than you'd probably think. The thing, this is like in the weeds, but like I think one thing to just keep in mind when you're doing, let's say you want to do this for like DFS or betting, right? Um, like the data manipulation the like building the data structure is going to be like so much of a higher percentage of the work than than you think it is like just think about it right you're like you want to forecast like how many passing yards a guy is gonna have well you need to go back and figure out well what did we know going into each past game about that player and setting up the data structurally to do that and like that like at first sounds easy and then think about like how how you actually go about doing that and you have to do all of that before you get to the modeling and i just i only say it to like don't sleep on that part of the whole process because it will take a, a long time sure um oh i want to get the list of questions but i i i did want to ask about modeling for team level outcomes so i don't know if you're involved in this seth but every year like espn comes out with these these like team level stuff and it's like oh the celtics are 95 percent to win and the betting market only has them 70 percent to win and gambling twitter goes crazy and says look at these idiots at espn their models way off they don't respect the market blah 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 I'm, I'm sure you've seen all this i think i saw some similar stuff with sis and win totals that are you know against the market and stuff like that how do you think about being so far if the model is so far off of a liquid market such as nfl futures or nba finals or something does that mean the model is definitely wrong or how do you guys think about this team level type stuff? It's a really interesting question. So that is like my team uh, creates our like power indices and we've evolved like back and forth on this point many times. So like our football stuff or NFL stuff uh, originates from a, from a betting market. So like we're like 95% is, is, is betting market based in the preseason. So we're always sort of starting from that place and you just, for, for football, you have to just because like quantifying the player movement would be really difficult. I wouldn't say you have to, it just, it's just way harder. It is like, it, it, it certainly like, okay, when we had that Celtics situation that you, like that you're talking about, I mean, we were wrong, right? Like, let's like be clear. I think we would never dispute that they did not, like they didn't have a 96% chance to win or whatever it was. The, the, the irony was like the model had performed really well that year in the sense that like if you looked at the mean absolute error for for games relative to uh, the betting market, like it was right. It was right there. Um, but I think what was important for us, for ESPN, from a content standpoint, was like not just what we said, like not just global accuracy, but local accuracy, too. I think that it's OK to deviate from the betting market, but I think that like we pay close attention to the betting market. I think we should have like a lot of respect for it. And if we're deviating from it, then we, you know, we should know why or we should try to have we should try to have a sense why. I mean, it, like that situation in in the NBA is like um, unideal. In the NFL, our, our model will like never be um, very far away from from the betting market, though. Yeah, Matt, I'm not sure how much team modeling you guys are doing. I know you put out some team level projections, I, I think, for this year. But yeah, I, what do you think about yeah, all Matt that? had his Saints homer bias in the yeah in the exactly. Model. No, I think I think that um, you have to keep in mind exactly what Seth said. Is your model incorporating the betting markets and is it basically just like a regurgitation of like what the efficient market is? Anybody could tell you that. Or are you trying to provide something that's an opinion um, that is not incorporating that stuff or that that weights the amount that it uses that stuff? So we did something that was totally separate, totally independent from that, because we wanted to see, hey, what is what do our results look like compared to where the markets are right now? Uh, last year. We had a, some success with it, but um, you know we'll see uh, what happens this year. Um, James Weaver, who is responsible for a lot of the modeling that goes on on our side, I, I actually asked him about that, 
and he he had a really interesting perspective on it because um, when you're doing a, mo a model and comparing it to the markets, basically the public markets incorporate all of the public information that's available. So if you think you have an edge and something that's not publicly available information, maybe it's your SIS data set, maybe it's uh, your injury risk model, maybe it's that you're biased against French people that are tall, whatever it is, um, you, you have your thing. What you want to be able to do is back test it. And this is, again, where you get back to the technical proficiency and, and needing to have some of that stuff. But um, it's interesting because off by a large amount is kind of a funny one. Um, if you are totally like uncalibrated, uh, if you're not uncalibrated, if you are not using any of those public markets and you're just testing based on, uh, your own predictions, if you're off by a large amount, that might not be a good sign. But if you look at certain thresholds and you're like, oh, well, the model says it's plus three and a half, but the line is plus two and a half right now. Okay. Now I know that, that I might have a valuable edge there because in my back testing, <laughs> When that situation came up, I was right more often than not. So you want to just collect the data about how it's performed in the past to make sure you really understand it. And you want to know your models, like going back to like the, the football guy versus the analytics guy thing. It's very much that to use any of these models, a fourth down model, you should have a really good understanding of what it incorporates and what it doesn't incorporate so that you have a better understanding of when you can deviate from it or when you should trust it wholeheartedly. Yeah, right. I know I know for our stuff to Matt's point like we really understand like where there might be leaks in the model and where there aren't um which is you know super critical to patching that like when we're using it in real time I'm also just fascinated in general of like you know I think I've made mistakes in this area before in the past but like directionally accurate versus like just having a bad model sometimes can be like a fine line um so like if you're you know way off the market you might just say well we know we're not right but it probably leans that way right um yeah sometimes that's true sometimes you got to be careful that you're not just copying out and you've just built the bad model and that's why it's off by so much so that's something that's like really difficult to discern sometimes for I sure would say yeah. like if you're doing you know i do uh prop modeling you know like play you know player prop modeling myself and like a, a difference is like, like, let's say you're doing this at home and you're doing it for DFS or, or for betting, like an advantage you have is that you can uh, like throw things out. So like, like um, we only said, like you have, you know where your leaks are, right? So sometimes, so like, I know I'm, I'm doing like defensive player props and most of the time it works, but then like, okay, I know there's an odd situation. This, his teammates coming back from injury, his playing time is going to be reduced. It's not going to be reflected here. Okay, whatever. I can just throw it out. Like if we're, but like for our team projections, we cannot just throw things out, but use that to your advantage if you're, if you're doing it for DFS or betting. A hundred percent. Yeah. And like it's always easier when not everybody sees everything. Not everybody sees. Yeah, exactly. It's just, yeah. That's true. Exactly. Easy to find the one thing. Like Adam talks about this a lot with the betting markets. Yeah. Like, like we've just got to find one thing that's off, right? Like to bet against. Right. Um, and like, if it's your model and you don't have that information from like people betting against your model, like, there's going to be things that are off and it's easy for people to kind of cherry pick yeah. those and make them. Look oh, quite bad. dude, people say this to me all the time. They're like, Hey, why, why, you know, uh, do you, you guys should, uh, your projections are so good. You should provide the sports books with projections for, with, uh, lines for every player. I'm like, buddy, I already have a hard time sleeping. I cannot put up 3000 lines and have four of them be off out of 3000 and us lose a million dollars. Like I just, I, I can't face that and I'll never be able to live. But on the other side of it, we're looking at 3000 lines. And we're able to find four that we think are wrong. And, you know, that that obviously is a huge advantage to being uh, a better for sure. All right. Let's get to a few uh, listener questions here. Got about five of them from Funconomist. He says, we'd love to hear thoughts on what advancements in AI and applications of AI to data science might have in forecasting NFL capabilities. So we talked about this already a little bit with ChatGPT, which is obviously helping people code more, code faster, build models better Seth any ideas from you further on the AI revolution to me it's like yeah that's like the current where it's helpful and it is really helpful uh I don't feel like I'm smart enough to be able to like see what happens next I can imagine that we talked about like the complexity of these player tracking models and like especially something like scheme and like we're talking about like scheme and space and like 
could AI help in that area? I imagine yes. I just don't. I'm just not smart enough to know like what that looks like in three years and how that could be. Yeah, yeah. it's really hard to see the future of AI. It feels like we're in like the very, very first inning. All I know uh, is that Nvidia is now the most valuable company in the entire freaking world. So well, here we are. It, well, it's hard to see like where it all ends up, but it's easy to see that it's that it's impacting a lot of things. And even if AI is like a big idea, like at its core, it's it's machine learning models. Um, that are going to be improving over time. So we we uh, have embraced machine learning to do things like instead of having manual data points collected, it, there are areas where we can automate the data points based on computer vision. So that's that's one area where it's uh, helped. Uh, I mentioned our injury risk models that we do before. The the amount of information that's required to build a, an injury model that's calibrated, I don't think you can do that with a stepwise linear regression. Um, anywhere near the the accuracy that we have, right? So these really well calibrated models that are because there's more brain power than all of us have combined going into what's making it. Um, that's really helpful. I think we could get to a point where right right now, uh, computers beat people pretty handily at chess all the time. Football's chess on grass, so the on grass part is the people, and that they're always going to be doing better, worse, but. To the extent that we can capture all of that information, there's no reason to think that play calling couldn't be optimized by artificial intelligence. There's no reason to think that we couldn't even train play callers like that the same way you would train a, tress, a chess master against a, an AI opponent. So there's the possibilities are obviously endless, but um, I, I think a lot of the short term stuff is going to be more where like media companies and things like that can make money off of it. And because uh, more of the investments going there rather than like solving football. Uh, sure. OK, uh, Julian asked an interesting question. Julian said, what's something people always tout as important in data analysis for player evaluation, but it's actually not. And this is part of what we're working on, Leone, where I, if you guys saw, I tweeted uh, something like, uh, what are some NFL narratives that you guys want us to test? And people sent back tons of them you know people are always shilling me these narratives they're like adam you can't play this guy because he's playing a team that plays zone and he's only good against man you can't play him. if they're going to play zone you can't you can't play him in defense and i'm just like i really really i, I don't know but i really don't think that's now, cover three or case. cover four what, what kind of zone are they playing <laughs> yeah, oh, exactly. no? yeah. okay i'm probably going to ignore you yeah <laughs> yeah so leon any thoughts on julian's question here i'm curious what seth and matt think about this one too something that people tout as important for player evaluation, but it's actually not. Yeah, I mean, we're in the process of looking at a lot of, again, like more advanced data that we're getting from SIS, some of this man zone stuff. And, um, you know, to Matt's point, like what kind of zone is it? Like, you know, there's so many different ways you can break this down, but in general, you have to be able to say like, for this example, okay, the play, he's been better versus zone versus man. If we look at those like yards per out run by those splits moving forward, what's more predictive of his zone yards per out run? Is it just his zone or is it like a combination of his man and his zone stats? Like what, what actually matters more? And then, you know, wh what are the odds that, you know, how frequently can we predict that this defense is actually going to play zone? We know they play zone a lot, but if it's like 60% versus 40%, like how does that actually alter the projection? I think a lot of these cases, it might not, you know, be as meaningful as people think it's certainly something that we want to look at and again i talk about being more accurate directionally like move things in the correct direction by layering this stuff in but you definitely can't just like oversimplify just say yeah. oh he's great first man and th this defense plays more man than average i've done that exact project and so i took everyone every route and then take like like every route and then compare to coverage is not just man zone but like it really it's especially it's the shells like two hivers, whatever. So like, you know, like if you run a, a go, it's way more likely to work against cover three or cover one than it is against uh, cover two or quarters. But like, so I found, so I like basically made this, you know, uh, chart of every route versus every coverage. And there's like pretty wide disparities. And so I was like really encouraged because I was like, oh my God, it's gonna be amazing. Like when MVS is playing a cover three team, he's gonna explode. And when, and so like I, I did like I ran it out. So basically assuming everybody runs what they've done in the past and then like both in terms of the routes and the coverages. And then I go through the whole thing, right, to say like basically your expected yards. How much should your expected yards be different 
against this opponent than the average opponent. Um, and like for fantasy, you're looking for small edges, right? So maybe it's useful, but man, I was a little disappointed when I came to the result, yeah. kind of like plus two and a half yards, you know, kind of thing. Like maybe. Yeah, and it matters, but it's, it matters, it's smaller. It's not, it's not, and that's with some like pretty favorable assumptions too, like in terms of stuff not changing that, you know, maybe will change. So Absolutely. I, I, and like, you might just hit that once. Like MVS, like we think, oh, these guys run this same route. It's like, well, this guy runs that route a lot because he runs it like five times a game instead of three times a game, you know? It's like, yeah. It's so like, the way, the way I'd be more likely to think about this to, to like bring it back to like the DFS sphere, say you're trying to like construct a lineup and you want to like lean in on a certain offense in a certain way. What you might say is, oh, they're going against a man heavy defense. And specifically, usually like three quarters of teams are zone heavy compared to man heavy uh, based on our charting each year. Um, and then of the man heavy teams, they're usually better at man. And that's why they play more man. But they'll always be the little stragglers there. If you want to go against a man heavy team, which is going to be good because you're going to increase the volatility that you're going to see defensively, right? You'll see more touchdowns and more interceptions against a man team. Whereas zone, it's going to be more checkdowns and it's going to be a lot of safer stuff that plays out over large populations. And, and we feel really good about that. So if I'm trying to make a volatile play where like, oh man, I think Blaine Gabbert's going to blow up this week. That might actually make sense against the right defense. When, when you start to think about uh, making an, a, like a one-off bet on something strategically, it, it, I agree. When you, when you start to look at it in like the context of a model, um, it gets really difficult really quickly to see major major adjustments based on that yeah but, uh, yeah no that's super sharp though to look at the volatility because obviously in dfs that matters a ton because we're looking at the higher end outcomes matter a lot more than the median outcome so that yeah that does make sense and and i don't want to poo poo all these narratives by the way like i think some of these are actually we're going to find that they're true we're testing them but like rushing quarterbacks you know lamar jackson or uh you know um any you know big rushing quarterback doesn't throw to running back as much as a pocket passer would, right? And I, I, that's an assumption that I have. We're testing it, uh, but I kind of think that one's going to turn out to be true. Another one that I'm interested in is rushing quarterbacks versus man coverage. In other words, the whole idea is that when you're in man, you might turn your back to the quarterback. You're not looking at him. Next thing you know, he's up the field for 20 yards. And so I'm sure all this stuff has been looked at, but we're looking at it uh, again, and, and we'll have a video slash show slash article with our findings on it. I'll give you uh, one good one where there is a big difference. And I'm you know, like, I can't believe I'm just giving this out here because I bet this successfully. And you look like this whole podcast is DMS of betting people. So I'm just blowing <laughs> it up. But uh, but this is one where there is a really big difference, which is running back receptions against man and zone. And they are substantially different where uh, you get way more running back receptions uh, like on a rate basis against zone than against man. Okay. Yeah. We found some stuff with blitz rates too, with running back mm -hmm. receptions and not having to block as frequently. Um, okay. Tim asked, is win probability a useful stat? So this is an interesting question to me because the only time I see win probability really talked about in the public sphere is when somebody's like 99% to win and they end up losing the game. And everybody's like, look, at this time they were 99% and all the idiots come back in the comments. This model's stupid. They obviously weren't 99% because they ended up losing the game. Now, where I am very interested in win probability models is for live betting. And our good friend, Matt Davidow is very deep into the modeling of live betting streets. He thinks it's extremely exploitable. And I actually don't disagree. If you're looking to bet right now and you're in a sharp person, I would be looking at live markets and if you can model what's happening live, because it is the wild west out there in terms of live stuff. But anyways, uh, Seth, any thoughts on win probability, is it a useful stat for anyone? It, it is a useful stat, but it's as a, like, as an input elsewhere. So, uh, like, all of our fourth down work, everyone's fourth down work is driven by win probability. The accuracy of your win probability model is going to determine your fourth down recommendations. And, like, that's crucial. I mean, that's, like, that's the ball game right there. So, yeah, it's really useful. And then also uh, when you're looking at it, it's useful for filtering out garbage time or at least, or it doesn't have to be filtering. You can just accounting for garbage time uh, in, a, in a way that's going to, yeah, you could, you could do it like with scores and clock or whatever, but to just be more accurate, you're going to use win probability. Like in terms of direct applications, I think there's usefulness in terms of 
storylines. We talk about like the importance of this play relative to to a team winning a game. Like that certainly matters, and um, it's certainly nice. Like whatever trivia, like like you're talking about. But then yes, obviously betting would be the the, the most critical. Like yeah, the rest sure. application. For sure. Yeah, maybe I'm misunderstanding the question, but like the sort of like the big four in the way that you know I teach a class at NYU, expected points, expected points added, win probability, and win probability added. They all have slightly different uses, but they're all like very, very valuable uh, in all of their different ways. Like expected points literally takes all of the context of down distance and yard line and lets you know how many points that's worth on the field. Then expected points added added can tell you the value of a play on the scoreboard or the value of a drive on the scoreboard, depending on what the field position was and, and all that other kinds of stuff. Uh, win probability mostly is used for uh, decision making, right? You want to maximize your expected win probability with every decision that you make. Of course, that's valuable. I, I couldn't understand how that wouldn't be valuable. Um, and then win probability added, I would never recommend saying, oh, look at how much win probability this player added, because it depends if it was the first play of the game or the last play of the game uh, and all that kind of stuff. But narrative stats, storytelling, now you show me a good win probability chart from a game and I feel like I watched half of it. Um, so uh, I think that's, yeah, I, I don't know what they mean by is that valuable? Of course it's valuable, <laughs> but only if it's good. All right. And it's hard to be really good. And that's where the live betting stuff, that's why when I say it's the wild west, because everybody's win probability model varies really widely. I think it's, yeah, I'm betting, it's, think not a, it's not as efficient a market, right? hundred percent. So it's all over the place and it's based on what's coming in and people, don't have very efficient models uh, compared to the book. Uh, I was curious if you guys think there's teams or will be teams and coaches that take into account like pregame win probabilities a little bit more. Like my sense is most coaches are like going into a game with a little bit more like, you know, they're, they're not thinking we're six point dogs, you know, they're thinking like we're going to win the game. But like in the NBA, if you get, you know, an underdog, they might ratchet up the three point shooting, right? Like increase the variance. They know they're underdogs. If you see any elements of that, you know, leaking over to the NFL in terms of like how they, they attack teams or if they get more aggressive on fourth down, just understanding, you know, the, the, the market-based win probability, or if you think most teams are just going to like ignore yeah. the Yeah, I mean, look at every, the way every team plays the Chiefs, I think, uh, for the most part, like uh, generally when you build your win probability model and you incorporate your team strength adjustments, they will be adjusting for something that's like the spread. Um, there are other things that you can use, but something along those lines generally to indicate the team quality. And you'll get different recommendations on your charts depending on if they think the team's better or worse and also depending on the expected pace of the game and what sort of pace you'd like the game to be set at. So you can adjust those and you can actually say, hey, coach, here's what the model says. It's a little bit different than usual because we're 14-point dogs. Oh, that's bullshit. You're adjusted to make it. We're just a touchdown dogs. Whatever you want to do. You can actually kind of adjust that stuff and, and play around with it a little bit. So um, it's definitely, yeah. Um, okay. We haven't had any micro takes here. I mean, the people are starved. They're starved for an, uh, for, for, for micro takes. I guess what, what, I have two parts. First, uh, we can start with you, Seth. Which teams do you think the best are on analytics? Because the narrative out there is it's the Eagles, the Ravens, the Browns. Those are the best teams on analytics. And after that, it's just a swath of, people that are trying to catch up is that a fair characterization do you think of what's going on in the nfl in terms of who's doing it best right now yeah i would put it browns one and these takes are informed by every year every other year i do a survey of analytics staffers and ask them what they think because they have the best sense so i would put browns sort of alone at the top then baltimore and philly like you said and then below them i think that teams that probably jump out would be Dallas, Buffalo, um, Colts. Um, no, I mean, I wouldn't probably put them there anymore. Um, San Francisco. I would have mentioned San Francisco. And then I think the Vikings, you probably have to throw into the equation just because of how they're sort of layering that in now. You know who's a sleeper team? I, said, Maybe. I don't know. I mean, like. <laughs> They've done some weird stuff lately. Yeah. I Like, here's the thing. I like, I, yeah, I would have said that. They have the first GM who came up through analytics ranks. 
I'm, I have moved from like assuming that to be true to uh, unconvinced based on like track record at this point. Yeah. Just based on like uh, fourth down decision making or free agency. I mean, like a signing Aaron Jones, but like Aaron Jones, yeah. What did you say? Aaron Jones signing. Aaron Jones, I, well, like I would say, like the Dallas Turner trade would be like maybe the 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 biggest thing, or like actually no, even bigger would be they moved up a few times, yeah. Trading the, the when they made that deal with the Texans, I mean that didn't make any sense, and it only made sense if it was like as a means to an end it, to a quarterback, which it still didn't make any sense, and uh, that would like raise some major red flags, I would say. But like I don't, I want to be clear on this point, especially like I don't know that. I'm just saying like my my tea leaf reading i will sure. say the one team you just mentioned that they traded with the texans they're my dark horse better analytics department than you expect nobody talks about it but it's mm -hmm. not just their analytics it's their tech infrastructure they've done a really good job there yeah they're building a, a really good team from where i can tell are the uh houston texans right here speaking of that i can't let you get out of here last thing hot takes for this season, I know Leone has some hot takes he's trying to get off. These should be database take database takes, Leone. Not you're gonna drink a bunch of beer and jump into a table at the Bills games take. Josh Allen these, are, these are data, these are database takes. Any hot takes for you on this upcoming season before we get out of here? Um, I, I feel like I only have Bills Homer, Homer <laughs> takes, which is me and you going head to head against the Jets. Adam's very pro Jets, and I'm I'm a little bit concerned about the Jets this year. So uh, maybe some some Jets to not make the playoffs futures. Okay, yeah, you'd have to. I think you have to lay money on that. Jets were at one point around three to one to win the division, which I thought was good. Leone somehow like badgered me into some straight heads up bet: Bills versus Jets or something ridiculous. <laughs> like get that. It good. Anyways, uh, Matt, any takes that you'd like to get off your chest for this season? Uh, I don't have like anything super hot. I think you saw the the SIS win probability models. They came in. They came in high on the Saints, so that's probably as good as one as as, as I have there. Um, because I look at that, I think the model's probably right, and I have a hard time seeing how they, they would come in under this year. Yeah, I, I do think that the uh, offensive scheme change makes a difference for the Saints. I really didn't like what they were running last year. Uh, Seth, any uh, takes for you for the season? Okay, I'll give you two. I feel like uh, I think Eagles are going to be really, really good Super Bowl contender. Uh, it it's not from like anything other than just like looking at their roster. It's incredibly good. I feel like everybody's sleeping on it. People felt like they were held back by coaching. They changed their offensive coordinator and upgrade, I think probably on both sides of the ball. Like I see very little reason why Philadelphia shouldn't be awesome. And then, uh, okay, speaking of the Jets, and this came back to something you mentioned earlier, I think we're going to look at Garrett Wilson as, as like a true – truly exceptional un like very clear top five receiver by the end of the by the end of this year and that's not like crazy take given like where he's going in fantasy but i think sometimes we have all these metrics right and i i i believe in them and i i, I certainly pay close attention but you, you never you never really know and and i do this thing at the end of every year i do this like a 100 player mvp ballot and i had wilson like pretty low i mean he didn't have like a insane year or anything right you're like a thousand yards um and I, I i always run it by people in the league like uh you know smart smart analytics folks in the league and multiple people were like what are you doing on garrett wilson like he didn't yeah he didn't have a quarterback this guy's like unbelievable like truly one of the best receivers in the league last year and like I mean, he was top five in open score last year, right? Like I should be listening to my own, to our own metrics, which are saying like, hey, let's track how he does on every play, whether or not he gets the, gets the ball. And I'm like, yeah, what am I, what am I thinking? And they're like, no, no, no. I think I put him at like 40 and multiple people were like, no, 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 you don't understand. He's way, way higher than that. So yeah. Garrett Wilson, monster season. Super excited. Said, Adam, one that we've been looking at is, uh, Will Levis and the Titans just throwing a lot more. It's hard to like find something actionable. Like I'm looking at futures for like most regular season pass yards, but it's just such a such a long shot there. And then like you don't really want to bet that against the regular prop line because that's more a 50 50 thing and you're looking at range of outcomes. But um, the Titans passing game, I guess, could be um, a, re change a lot from yes. what we saw last year. Yes. Exactly. They, they two big philosophy changes like that. Falcons, Bears, etc. Oh, I did need to ask you, Seth. Drake London is seventy fifth in 
open score? Have I been drafting too much Drake Drake London? Shall I pull back my Drake London exposure based on how bad he's been in open score? I've been fading him. I did a I did a project like looking at open score relative to fantasy ADPs to see if there was like value in re- like even relative to fantasy, and I found that there was for both open score and catch score, but more uh, open score. And like London was when I did that one of the players that was like most you know, most out of line. So yes, I have been consistently passing on him. Yeah. Sometimes I'm on the clock and it's like London, Marvin Harrison, Olave. Um, I've been leaning London there, but I probably should start mixing it up. Uh, I have been re- like, this is probably dumb, but like I just reach right down to Ayuk or Nico Collins at that point. Yeah. Well, the London one's fascinating to me to see how this plays out just with so much context change, but like also having the bad open score. I know like, I talked about JJ Zach Reason before who does some prospect modeling and like he does a year two model and London was like right up there with like Alave and Garrett Wilson mm-hmm. after the those really good rookie years. But he's not looking at something like open score. It's more based on like yards per out run and and those types of metrics. So I'm very curious to see that because right now we're we're a little hot uh London, a little light Wilson. We probably will make some tweaks there based on the open score stuff, but the, it should be fun to see what those two guys do. Yeah. I definitely agree with Seth on the on the Eagles too. I don't think people like understand how oh. their secondary has been revamped. I mean, for the offensive stuff we know, but their secondary has been revamped and I think it'll be uh, make a huge difference. Uh, and like if your problem is Darius Slay and James Bradbury, like I know they're yeah. older, but like corner play is just all over the place. These are guys who were both really good at one point. Like it's not impossible they play well again. Oh yeah, yeah. And they got as it relates to fantasy too. We have a very like a pretty pro Jalen Hurts position where it feels like there's a lot of recency bias and like how last year ended. Um, and forgetting he averaged like 26 points per game two seasons ago with like a game he left early. So yeah, um, yeah. I think of the Bills and the Eagles in this sort of same way. It's like there's such a, a weird taste in my mouth, but these are good rosters in a lot of ways. So. Um, could see those ones going divergent completely. I could see you could you could convince me anything could happen with those. Yeah, for sure. All right, we're getting to the fantasy take portion of the show, which means that it it is time to wrap up here. This was really interesting. Hope you guys enjoyed this. I know it's not the type of thing that we normally do, but I think it's an important thing to do because it's interesting and it's the future of the NFL and trying to figure out where it's going. Matt, thanks so much for your time. Tell the people where they can find you on social and where they can find your work, assuming they don't want to enroll in NYU. Yeah, you can find me at Matt Mano on Twitter and uh, the company at SportsInfo underscore SIS. Check us out at SportsInfoSolutions.com. Um, and uh, we do a bunch of stuff in the uh, sports betting space now too. So if you're interested in that, you can hit us up there, get some unique data. Oh, If people want like SIS data, can they just like, go to SIS and buy data directly from you? Or do you need to be like, Yeah, you can sign directly? up for, we have something called the Data Hub that you can sign up for. Um, our stuff, we wish it was a, a bit cheaper. We have a few things that are out there that we put out for free, um, but it is expensive to gather a lot of this uh, unique data. Um, so they're paid tools that people can get, but you can get a Data Hub account for I think $100 a month. So that's not the worst thing to do if you're in August trying to figure out your lineups and, and what you're doing. All right, Seth, tell the people where they can find you on social and where they can find your work. Uh, at Seth Walder uh, on Twitter, and you can find my work on ESPN.com, sometimes on ESPN Bet Live. And uh, if you're looking for open score or any of our receiver tracking metrics, things that we can't, that we don't have yet on ESPN.com, we have this like sandbox site, ESPNanalytics.com. We're just trying to throw uh, some of our other work up there, and you can find all the receiver metrics right there. So check it out. It's so funny. Like we've come so far and still, and still Seth's work is even on ESPN.com. It has to be siloed on ESPNanalytics.com. We've come so far, but not far enough. Stay in the corner, nerd. <laughs> Leone, of course, tell the people, I believe know where they can find you, but remind them. Yeah, find me uh, with Established to Run and Adam, and we're putting together a bunch of best ball stuff right now. That's what's most popular uh at this time of year so if you're drafting on underdog draft kings wherever make sure you check us out we've got full rankings and i've been working on uh, an update of the best ball manifesto i wrote last year to kind of help with the strategy of playing in some of these bigger tournaments yeah and we'll be back leon and i will be back probably sometime mid late july to go through all of those narratives you know the the man versus zone stuff and the 
you know, quarterbacks throw to running back in this situation more often than and all the kinds of narratives that you guys sent. Uh, so stay tuned for that. We'll be back with that probably late July, early August or so. Go I should ahead, mention one more thing uh, for Sports Info Solutions. Checked out the uh, Off the Charts football podcast, wherever you get your podcasts, uh, if you're interested in more of the nerd talk. All right. More nerd talk, of course. If you made it through an hour and 20 minutes of this, you qualify for more nerd talk. So congratulations. For Leone, for Matt, for Seth, I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.